So good day, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Community Central, where we examine what is happening in the various communities in the Red Hat ecosystem. My name is Brian Proppet. I am with the Red Hat Open Source Program Office, and we will be getting started with our presentation momentarily from our guests uh, this week. But before I do, the usual housekeeping notes. Um, in Blue Jeans, there is a Q&A tool that we encourage you to use to ask questions for our presenters after they are done with their uh, presentation and their panel, um, and their demo rather, we will um, get those questions asked in the order of most light. Um, so be sure to get your questions in, uh, and we will go over those uh, towards the end of the session. So housekeeping out of the way, I'm very pleased to announce members of the Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management Team they are here today to talk to us about open cluster management, what it is, how it works, and, and how we can all benefit from that. So, gentlemen, good day. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brian, for having us. We're excited to have the opportunity to talk to the community. Okay. So, Michael Elder, get, get us started, and uh, we'll be looking forward to hearing what you got. Absolutely. So, uh, hi everyone, my name is Michael. I'm joined today by Mike and Gurney. Joe Jen, because of time zones, won't be joining this call, but has heard a lot of the content that you'll conversation. What we want to do is just to explain what we're doing with the Open Cluster Management Project. This is a new project that has been launched largely by Red Hat, but we're, we are beginning to engage more vendors in the community. We may uh, uh, talk a little bit more about which vendors in, in just a minute, but ultimately we are preparing this as something that we can propose as a project, as a way to engage a broader multi-vendor community effort to simplify the problem of managing many clusters. So one of the key aspects here is that open cluster management doesn't try to solve problems that are already well addressed in the community. Things like cluster lifecycle. There's lots of different, maybe let's keep it on that slide just for a sec, Mike. Um, if, you look at, if you look at what things uh, like cluster API in the community are focused on, they're focused on provisioning clusters, being able to drive some of the upgrade behavior, being able to store clusters across different cloud providers, across different vendors. Within OpenShift, we have Hive, which drives that same behavior. There's projects like Thanos, which really help you with understanding health metrics of many clusters, aggregating information. Uh, there's capability like Open Policy Agent that helps deal with certain aspects of compliance. But what we're going to talk about is really how open cluster management as a community builds additional capability that helps bring these separate tools together so that you have a unified understanding of concepts like the inventory of clusters, you have a unified way of delivering and managing agents on the parts of the fleet, and that agent behavior can then help configure projects like Thanos that need certain configuration across many clusters to collect health metrics, help you drive and enforce policy either through the native governance policy framework that's in open cluster management, or to integrate other community projects like Falco, Open Policy Agent. Obviously, there's capability that we have been working on with Argo as well that we'll talk about. So ultimately, we have this sort of proving ground of being able to bring together many different parts of the community and deliver a holistic solution for fleet management. On the next slide, let's talk about what are some of the, the common themes. And Mike, I don't know if you've been able to toggle to the next slide there. Thank you very much. What are some of the common themes that any, uh, any community project that wants to become multi-cluster aware, what aspects do they need to address? I'm gonna take a step back. First off, if you're going to be multi-cluster, you're gonna manage a fleet. You need an inventory of the fleet. There's many different ways that say Argo versus Thanos versus other projects understand a concept of the clusters that they are attempting to interact with. In some cases, Open Policy Agent or Falco don't have a concept built in. They're really more single cluster behavior. But if you're gonna become multi-cluster, you need to understand what clusters are available to manage. If you're gonna become multi-cluster, you also 
need a way to describe where you want specific configuration to be placed. In the community, past projects like Coop Federation have focused early on or largely on concepts like federating a deployment, federating services, et cetera. One of the things that we focused on in open cluster management is taking any Kubernetes CR and being able to deliver it across a set of clusters and understand why it's matched to cluster one versus cluster five, right? So some of the dynamic matching behavior uh, is, is codified within some of the API that we're talking about here with open cluster management. Once you decide where you want to put something in the fleet, you also then need a way to deliver and continuously reconcile pushing configurations to the fleet. Now, sometimes this is a purely GitOps conversation where I want content in a Git repo to be delivered out to a particular cluster. And there is a native GitOps application delivery and policy delivery capability that's in open cluster management. We've begun doing quite a bit of work to integrate Argo to make that a more seamless experience and leverage OpenShift GitOps as a provider. But here, when we talk about this API called manifest work, there's often behavior that we want to program. We want to be able to create a multi-cluster aware orchestrator that can programmatically describe the configuration that needs to be sent to each of the different clusters in the environment. And then, if I'm going to have any kind of multi-cluster fleet capability, I need a way to think about role-based access control. And that concept really is about, I have three teams, one, two, and three, they each have access to only clusters that are related to their day-to-day -day activity. And if they describe a change that they want rolled out because of an application change or a policy change, I don't want them crossing streams. I don't want them actually impacting or stepping on each other or their subset of the fleet. So these are sort of four principles that we believe are critical for multi-cluster. Each of the API in the red boxes, manage cluster, placement, manifest work, manage cluster set, these are some of the API that are, not all of it, but some of the API that are critical in the cluster management community. And under, inside of that box, for examples like Thanos Submariner or Submariner, depending on your preferred pronunciation. These are examples where in our supported offering, we have created a multi-cluster operator that helps you simplify provisioning Submariner across a set of clusters so that they can interconnect their networking layer. We have created a multi-cluster operator that can deploy a Thanos data store on a control hub and then ultimately link back uh, the clusters that are in the fleet so that they're in cluster Prometheus is sharing the correct data. We built examples that syndicate desired policy for open policy agent or Falco so that it's managed at a fleet wide level as opposed to on a cluster by cluster basis. And with Argo, not only have we orchestrated the distribution of Argo if you wanna manage Argo in each of the individual clusters. We are also working in the Argo community to help it adopt concepts like the placement behavior in a generic way. So the Argo project in the community can leverage concepts like the cluster inventory, cluster placement, cluster role-based access control from Open Cluster Management, right? So these two communities becoming bridged together. So these are sort of the core principles that we're ultimately going to talk about. Everything else that we're going to say is just coming back and referencing some of these basic ideas under the covers. Uh, let's flip to the next slide. So, and for this, it's got a little animation, Mike, if you just want to click through until it fills itself out. Basically, when we think about the, the, the architecture, we use a hub and spoke architecture within open cluster management. You've got the hub cluster ultimately running an operator a set of API services, a set of CRs. And then whenever I have a managed cluster, I've got an agent that's deployed on it. That agent is also operator driven and allows us to describe how we want that cluster to be configured. We can report basic health information back to the hub and, and do all the wonderful things that, that we're gonna talk about in more detail. But this is the basic architecture, a core hub. Today, open cluster management and the supported offering, Red Hat Advanced Cluster Manager, management for Kubernetes, these are primarily supported on OpenShift. 
but on the next slide, while the hub is largely restricted to OpenShift, the managed clusters can support other forms of Kubernetes. So we can provision OpenShift through Hive. We don't provision managed Kubernetes as a service. There are other community projects like Cluster API, Crossplane that can do that type of provisioning, or Ansible, which is probably one that we come across as much as anything else. But once I have a running cluster, Open Cluster Management will let us import that cluster. Import or join means that we run some pods on the target cluster. Those pods have network connectivity back to the hub and they report status, health information. They reconcile some of those concepts like manifest work so they can apply configuration changes. And so the hub itself actually becomes not only multi-cluster, i.e. multiple OpenShift clusters, but also multi-cloud, right? I can run not only OpenShift across all the different hyperscalers and my data center, we can also import and help provide a bridge. So you've got a consistent way of dealing with uh, managed Kubernetes as a service or ideally managed OpenShift as a service. The one caveat that I'll highlight here, your mileage may vary in terms of what a hub can do to an OpenShift cluster versus what a hub can do to Let's just pick on EKS just because they're fun to pick on. Um, EKS has some great capability, but EKS is not as operator centric in the way that you configure and manage it. You still typically fall back into a CLI or other configuration aspects, maybe a cloud form template, whatever, to stand up things around the EKS cluster in order to enable it to run correctly. The same would be true for virtually any of these. So they're not unique in that regard. But because the operator-centric configuration paradigm in OpenShift lets us actually uh, deploy a operand that says, here's how we want OpenShift to configure its authentication, an operand to deploy, to configure the networking or the storage or some other aspect of OpenShift, because everything is CR-driven, our method of delivering configuration to a cluster means we have more control over managing how we want an OpenShift cluster to be configured versus sort of a DIY Kubernetes or a managed Kubernetes as a service. I'll make that point. I'm not going to dwell on it anymore, but just helping to understand the distinction. Let's click forward one slide. This is largely an architecture that shows, well, it's valid for what's in open cluster, the hub and the managed cluster and some of the parts that run in it was really a slide, a architecture picture that talks about Red Hat Advanced Cluster Manager. So everything in Advanced Cluster Manager, with the exception of the search data store, I'll talk about it in a second, everything in Advanced Cluster Management is open source, except for our in implementation of Redis Graph. That's because of the source license that's on Redis Graph. We ultimately will replace that with an, a data store that has a more friendly OSS license over time. What we are working on with open cluster management as a CNCF proposal is a subset of what's in the product because the CNCF proposal won't have ties into things like Hive as OpenShift. There'll be ways to integrate it, but it won't have that hard link or dependency uh, that we use within the supported product form. There'll be other characteristics where we depend on uh, some of the operator configuration within OpenShift those are aspects that it won't necessarily be in the CNCF submission. So when I talk about the projects, everything here is open source, and there's a kernel that we think is very multi-vendor, very multi-Kubernetes that has broad interest. We have a vendor, uh, a, a community con co contributor within Ant Financial who already deployed open cluster management in production and use it to run their system, completely independent of the Red Hat ecosystem in that case. But the key point here is that You've got this foundation of open cluster management and we've got these sort of pillars and you see these white boxes in that uh, big red box, cluster lifecycle, application lifecycle, governance, risk and compliance and observability. A little dated, we should have another one here. The, the newer, newer version of this picture will show networking because of Submariner. But we're gonna talk about, we're gonna kind of just go down to the core layer of open cluster management. Mike is going to take us through an example demonstration of how to use just the basic community parts. And then from there, we are going to uh, talk about 
how placement and some of these other API that we just we said the name, but we didn't really explain what they did. And then we'll we'll continue to push through. We'll kind of manage our time a little bit here, but we want to highlight some of the ties that we leverage within advanced cluster management and how we kind of bring all the parts together. With that, Mike, if you are ready, I would poke you maybe to bump your font a little bit if you can in your terminal windows, and then take it away when you're ready. And Mike, just a heads up, if you are speaking, we can't hear your audio. Um, Got it. Now I'm gonna demo to show how you can bootstrap a multi-cluster control plane that as Michael described the hub cluster and then import another cluster into the hub cluster that we call the managed cluster. So I have two kind clusters here set up locally. On the left side, it's gonna represent the control plane hub cluster. On the right side, it's a soon to be managed cluster. So we have a few ways that we can bootstrap this process. We, we can use the available um, operators on the operator hub or what I'm about to show you using our own cluster admin binary, which is inspired by Kubernetes cube admin tool. So if you're familiar with the, um, with the cube admin tool, the workflow I'm about to show you will be very similar. Okay, I'm gonna start the process by running the cluster admin in it, um, which would deploy the cluster manager operator and its associated controller, as well as the output, the command that I need to register other clusters um, to the hub. So with this I can do, just to make sure we're on the same page, the left-hand side is your hub. So it's, yes. a, it's a kind cluster that's gonna become the hub. The right-hand terminal is a kind cluster that's gonna become the managed cluster. Exactly. Thank you, Michael. So on and the left side, yep, please. Go ahead. So now I'm gonna, on the, on the soon to be managed cluster, I'm gonna join the, I'm gonna kick off the process to join the, a, the cluster into the hub. So while we wait for this process, let's talk, uh, let's talk about um, what's happening in the background. So it's, so on the managed cluster side, um, after running the join command, it's currently deploying the cluster-led operator and associated controller. So the agent will generate a certificate signing request and using the, um, the generated, uh, using the token and then which generates the cube, uh, cube config. So after it's the, the agent is approved on the, on the hub, then the agent is authenticated. The agent currently is also creating a managed cluster resource on the hub side, and the cluster and the hub cluster admin will need to set a field hub accept client so the agent is authorized to call the hub. So this cluster registration process follows what we call the uh, double opt-in mechanism. So when the CSR and the managed cluster resource is created on the hub, that's when we can um, come back to the terminal and one the uh, on the hub side to run the cluster admin except cluster one, which basically means we're approving the CSR as well as opt in to explicitly accept the registration of the managed cluster. So let's first take a look and see if the managed cluster resource is created. And then we can also see can also see the certificate is here, but it's in pending condition and not approved. So as soon as I, I use the accept command, this will finalize the registration and bring the managed cluster under the hub's control. So from here on, Here are the list of APIs that are available at your disposal on the hub cluster, as what um, Michael just, uh, uh, described, the manifest work, the placements, uh, the managed cluster set, that really allows you to um, develop a solution with the multi-cluster capability or enhance your solution using these APIs with the multi-cluster um, uh, capability. So with that, I want to pass it back to 
uh, Michael to sure. continue talking about our offering. So before we kind of dive into that, let's talk about placement. So what you just saw with a very simple, very straightforward commands was effectively now enabling what you saw on the right terminal, a running cluster being linked now to a hub and eligible to accept application, configurations, whatever. We mentioned, or I mentioned earlier, this concept of placement. When we think about placement, we're thinking about the fact that a fleet should be treated like cattle, could be treated like um, a herd, where any individual member, any cluster can be transient, may only exist for a short period of time, should be largely disposable, right? Largely, we're trying to take that metaphor of how Kubernetes interacts with nodes or machines, and we're just elevating it up to the next level. So then if I think about configuring a new cluster that I use because of a CI/CD canary process, that I use for my development team to write code, that I use for doing quality assurance or quality engineering testing. These are clusters that may not live very long. So we think about the fleet as a set of API objects, those managed cluster API objects that we can actually tag or label like anything in Kubernetes. And we define this concept of placement that can describe a set of conditions that ultimately are matched to a specific physical set of current clusters. So that might be clusters, I might have 100 clusters total, and my placement rule picks three of them, or picks 10 of them, or picks all 100 of them, if I have that appropriate scope of uh, permissions. Do I have access at my user with my role bindings, cluster role bindings, do I have permissions to access all of them? And if I do, then my placement rule, my actual uh, API object, will generate a set of placement decisions that lists all of the matching clusters. So what this means is that if I am a project like Argo or Kubevela or any of the others that we've alluded to, I can leverage this API to make a decision about how I want my configuration for Argo and, and Kubevela, these are both application models, that allows them to say, I want my application to be deployed on any cluster that matches the placement. If a new cluster joins and dynamically matches the configuration, it will also receive that desired configuration, that desired state. If a cluster changes a condition, a label is removed, a health condition is no longer satisfied, it's no longer considered available, it's no longer at, has a sufficient capacity, whatever that condition is, if it's removed, then the configuration can also be pulled away from the cluster as well. This might happen if I had maybe three clusters that are spread across regions, and one cluster in one region experiences a, a catastrophic region failure. It's no longer eligible, but the placement rule needs at least clusters because of what's described in the API, and then we'll pick another cluster in another region that matches, and we'll roll out the application with the desired configuration there. The placement rules, again, are this building block that any project can consume. So I've talked about Argo primarily because it's one that we've done this. So if you look in the Argo community, you look at the concept of application set. Uh, there are members of our team uh, that are working with members in the community to extend the application set idea to understand placement. And they're doing that through a Kubernetes concept called duct types. I'm going to hand wave here. I'm not going to go into detail about what that is, but the net is that it allows Argo to leverage capability from open cluster management. All right, let's step forward. So, Mike, I don't know, did you want to cover any part of the app or do you want me to just keep talking? Um, Michael, could you keep continuing or I can cover it as well? It's up to you. It's okay. I'll, I'll push forward for a couple of slides. I'm not going to cover all of it in detail. I want to kind of hit the highlights, and then we, we'll come back and drill in more if we need more time. So I've talked about the concept of Argo and Kubella as community projects. Within Open Cluster Management, there is already this concept of application that's based on the SIG application API object. 
it leverages, and you can kind of see this in the picture, you'll see a little red circle called placements. And then in that list, that uh, flyout window, you'll see this concept of the clusters that were matched by the placement rule. So this application selects three clusters to deploy the app, and each of those clusters meet whatever the conditions are. And then the clusterlet, that agent that we saw join the hub, additionally has a concept of add-ons, which I think we'll, we'll talk about here in just a moment. Uh, but the add-on behavior allows us to plug in things like application-specific behavior, and that's now picking up and deploying the application parts to each of those three clusters. And so from that center blue circle in the middle, I can see concepts like route, deployment, replica set. Those are just your standard Kubernetes API objects that have been delivered and are being reconciled and managed on each of those target clusters that are matched by the placement rule. Next slide. So Argo has clearly had dramatic support within the open community. Red Hat has delivered a supported offering around Argo. And we wanted to enable integration because the concept of cluster in Argo, you have one of three deployment models. I can either deploy Argo in a namespace, I could deploy Argo at a cluster, or I could deploy it where it's managing other clusters from that control cluster. So we wanted to make it easy to use any one of those three models. And in this case, ACM can actually deploy Argo. You can also have Argo deploy ACM. To some extent, that depends on your use case and what you want to do to bootstrap the system. But you might have ACM bootstrap Argo if you actually want Argo deployed in each of the target clusters. So if we go back just one slide, and then we'll hit this one. Um, so what you're doing there is you're defining within a hub cluster, you're defining some objects that are the application objects in Argo. And the application objects are referencing Git repositories, one or more. Uh, one or more application objects referencing one or more Git repositories. And then Argo CD can deliver configuration down. Now, let's talk about, and that's the next slide here. I can either deploy the Argo, the OpenShift GitOps capability in my control cluster. And then what we would end up doing is that integration between Argo's application set and the open cluster management concept of placement rule, instead of Argo simply understanding a cluster as a kube config that it's making a remote API call with one user identity, we actually can have it understand the concept of cluster from ACM or from open cluster management. And it's only going to be able to see the clusters that that particular user has access to. So if I'm really trying to roll this out to a larger team, the role-based access control that we can insert because of open cluster management benefits teams that want to use Argo with greater scale. And so in this model, Argo is running on the same uh, hub cluster and pushing configuration down. On the next slide, here we kind of we flipped the model a little bit. We've got a hub cluster which is delivering a Argo configuration. So the, the operator for Argo is running on those remote managed clusters. This might be the right model if you want your development teams to have more control, more say so over their own Argo within the respective clusters they use. Because now the configuration for Argo for sort of team one can be different from the configuration of Argo from team two. The hub is still delivering the configuration, right? So the hub itself is still pulling that from some source like a GitHub repo, but I now can, can customize them in different ways. And that may make more sense there. All right, next slide. So this is a screen cap from advanced cluster management. Again, the UI itself is open source. It's just not part of what we think the CNCF community will be interested in because it has OpenShift-centric concepts and an OpenShift-centric UI design language. But here what we see is a list of individual applications 
So each one of these clusters, J and P dash, each one of those lines represents a cluster. You can see how multi-cloud that is, right? AWS, Azure, GCP, VMware. And each of those clusters is running an instance of Argo. And each of those Argos has deployed an application that came from the same Git repository. Then from the hub, we have a bird's eye view of each of those applications, when they were deployed, whether they're healthy, we can also do things to drill in beyond that. So if I'm a team that is managing a fleet and I have developers coming to me and saying, hey, Argo is the greatest thing since sliced bread, now is the team providing that fleet management experience, I can say, great, I will make this easy for you. I'll have Argo pre-configured in every cluster that you, you deploy or that you pull out of a cluster pool. And as soon as you get it, you'll have your Argo, it'll have its configuration. And if that cluster gets disposed of, the next cluster that I create will get the same configuration, it'll match the same. So that, that becomes a very powerful story, we think, for users within Kubernetes and particularly within OpenShift. Next slide. So you can also, um, you can also basically use this just to make it easier to scale out across the cluster because you've got that linkage to placement rule. The last slide is also a pretty good example of this where the same app is just being delivered across many environments. And then let's go ahead, we'll skip down. I'm gonna context switch on you and I'm gonna talk other integrations that we can do with an application. So with Argo, we're, we're basically making it easy to adopt a community GitOps solution for something that I can manage and deploy within a cluster. And the reality is that while Kubernetes is amazing at what you can program, there might still be things in the world that are not Kubernetes. Ask, right? Um, the reality is there's still a lot of systems that are involved, uh, bare metal machines, virtual machines, network devices, cloud API that don't have appropriate operator, things that live off of the Kubernetes cluster. There's also a very broad and vibrant community around it. So we wanted to actually do work to make these things easy. Both if I'm an Ansible administrator and I'm actually trying to make it easier for my teams to adopt Kubernetes, adopt OpenShift, adopt cluster management, cluster orchestration. Well, I've got to address how do I fit this new technology in with my existing ecosystem, where I have to insert behavior into F5 load balancers, where I have to insert behavior into CMDB, where I have to open a service now ticket for every change that goes into the system because I, I still have people that believe in ITIL, which may be great, like I'm not saying that to be negative on it, but for whatever reason, some orgs have it, some orgs don't. So in this integration flow, we can take that same concept of application that you saw. In fact, the diagram that we had on the earlier slide had two little circles called Ansible jobs. And you'll see that represented here. There's an, a resource called a Ansible job. Uh, this could be a Kubernetes job as well, but for the sake of argument. And that job helps us deliver and deploy a, or excuse me, to run, to make an API call that invokes Ansible to run a playbook. And that playbook then can configure things around the cluster. So what we're after is a fully automated release chain that allows us to continuously reconcile behavior that whenever it gets out of sync, that's sort of Kubernetes big value. But for these things that are more about occurring at discrete points in the life cycle, like opening a ServiceNow ticket, like updating a load balancer once I roll the application into a new cluster. These are aspects where we can bring in Ansible playbooks and the breadth of Ansible resources to do that type of behavior as well. And so then if I'm a, uh, someone who's trying to adopt clusters, adopt Kubernetes, we can make it easier for them to tie in the rest of that existing process. And over time, some of those things will become codified as operators, and they'll just get tied into that same, maybe Argo, CM, GitOps flow. And then over time, some things may not. It may not make sense. You know, ServiceNow as a Kubernetes CR terrifies me. I don't know if it terrifies you, but it does me. So, okay, that's apps. Let me kind of watch my clock here. Let's talk about, at a high level, I'm going to hit two more concepts, and then I think 
The next concept I want to talk about is governance. So application configuration generally is I've got a bag OYAML, Kubernetes manifests, that I want to treat as a unit. I want, I want to set a boundary that says this deployment, this service, these routes, these PVCs, all of these parts make up part of the same application. Yay. Governance, we typically see, comes out of another organizational pillar. Like if I look at an enterprise and I look at who's responsible for a separation of duties, governance typically spans all of the environment. It's not about sort of a boundary. It's about the entire environment. Now, it might be scoped, right? So a little bit of hand-waving here. But governance really is about delivering desired configuration, either auditing that it matches my technical controls. Typically, this is tied to a data security standard. Typical data security standards like personal cardholder information, PCI, data security standard, or PCI DSS. Data standards like HIPAA, uh, which is big in the North America industry, healthcare information provider, AA, I don't know the acronym, but in any case, those types of data standards, whether it's about financial information, healthcare information, sensitive personal information, those things typically have a big document, right? This industry around compliance and audit uh, regulation is still very manual, right? It's, it's sort of what we did to deploy systems 12 years ago pre-DevOps. And now we want to bring technology that helps that become more automated, more DevOps centric or DevSecOps, uh, which is a concept and term that's been around since 2013, 2014, but maybe now the maturity of the market is finally starting to absorb what that means. In this case, all of the same primitives, the way that I use placements, the way that we deliver configuration to target clusters continues to apply. And now we brought an additional add-on that understands policy in, in a very specific way. There is a policy framework where I can create policy controllers that describe behavior around IEM, behavior around SSO, behavior around CI, uh, the CI, CIS, uh, Container Information Security Standards, uh, using the built-in OpenShift CIS operator and delivering the desired configuration and profile across the entire fleet and reflecting back when there's a problem that exists today, delivering network policies, delivering desired projects and their appropriate limit ranges or uh, other conditions around them, delivering open policy agent integration. So there's a whole palette, uh, array of colors, an array of things that I can push down to clusters and I can drive that through governance and have a consistent way of delivering it and audit automating, both automating and auditing and automating the auditing, if you will. Uh, if we go to the next slide, this is a screen cap again of the UI that's in the, again, open source, but probably not something that goes into CNCF. Here we're looking at governance risk as a reporting function. So I can see concepts like the data standard it's related to, the category, the relevant control. I can see whether there are violations. All of these examples, there is a policy collection repo that is in the community. I strongly encourage you to take a look at that. We can provide the link after as well. But there is a broad array of policies that you can apply through GitOps. You can fork that repo, apply it to your cluster fleet, and get the benefit of all of that content right away. On the next slide, we think about governance architecture. These are all of some of the moving, well, all of some. This represents the majority of the policy controller framework. So again, you'll see the same foundations of managed cluster to represent inventory, placement, placement rule to represent matching it to a desired set within the fleet. But now you'll see additional things like the policy framework, uh, which also has integrations with Ansible that are coming in an upcoming release. That'll be the 2.3 release. We are working within the community with SIG policy to help contribute feedback as a stakeholder for policy report, which is a new API kind. We're working to integrate and adopt that within the product itself, within Open Cluster Management and with the supported offering. There's capabilities uh, that we've worked with other partners, like with IBM, around what's called Integrity Shield, which allows us to sign and validate configuration. So Kubernetes manifest having a signature that is validated before we apply it to a managed cluster. There is integrations uh, with observability that are coming in our 2.3 release as well. We've got open policy agents. So 
I'm listing off a lot of things, not to, not to brag so much on the great work the team has done, but just to highlight that this is not about just one dimension of one opinion about policy, but a way to, uh, to amplify policy across a fleet and provide you a consistent way to deliver it and audit it. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I'm not gonna talk about this. It'll be in the slide deck. Integrity Shield is the concept here. It's really powerful, but uh, I'll hand wave to encourage you to take a look. Uh, the last slide I wanna hit is about Submariner or Submariner. So Submariner is a framework that allows us to establish network connectivity bridge based on IPsec between multiple clusters so that the networks with their pods have cross cluster visibility. We are working with some early adopters who want to see Istio service mesh be run multi-cluster on top of this. In fact, some of the engineer who's driving that is one of the folks in the audience. So if you have questions, and I know he would love to, to hit some of those, but this becomes a really powerful way now to establish a boundary of clusters that are related to a team. We do that through concepts and open management. We configure the relevant parts for a submariner on each of these clusters so that they expose the relevant gateway and then we establish the right configuration with the broker so that these gateway nodes have connectivity between them. Why did I tell you all this? We've got a core capability with open cluster management that we that I continue to iterate on. We've got examples of application, of governance, networking. I didn't get into depth on observability or Thanos. I didn't get into depth in some of the other areas, but the key aspect is that this this core layer is one that we think has broad appeal to the community, which is why we're focused on contributing it to CNCF. The last slide, and then we'll take questions, is just a reference slide. We'll leave this up. We'll make the slide deck available. But if for some reason you don't get a hold of the slides, take a screen cap. You'll have all of the, uh, the logistics credentials. We have a YouTube channel where we publish our biweekly community meeting recordings. I would strongly advocate and encourage you to come join the meetings. They're open. They're right before the time slot that we join here, so 1030 on Thursdays, Eastern time. Uh, join the community, touch us on, on GitHub, figure out what you want to, to either fork or contribute to. We've tried to make it easy. There's lots of great examples where people have gotten involved and, and shown, OK, I can use open cluster management like service, service mesh. I can pull these things together. I can use open cluster management and Coop Bell and I can pull these things together. But there's a lot of good examples of that. So we'd love, love the involvement and the feedback. Let me pause, take a breath, see if anyone's still listening, and then take questions. We do have a number of questions and we are running a little short on time. So we'll try to get through as many of these as we can. Andres um, asks, does the hub cluster support Minikube, Minishift, and K3S for demonstration purposes in a small or one-node cluster? So certainly, if you look at, in fact, maybe, Mike, if you want to flip to slide seven. What Mike showed in the demo flow was using Kind, which is a really small footprint for Kubernetes and um, defining the cluster manager on one side and defining the clusterlet on the other side. So you can absolutely run these, these primitive parts, these, these building blocks on very small clusters. When you want to run the supported offering, we only support running that in OpenShift. There are some examples of deploying that to CRC, Code Ready Containers. There's a blog about that. If you Google Code Ready Containers, ACM, you should be able to track that down. And in terms of importing, so if you're importing a cluster, we use K3S as part of our scalability testing. Uh, Gurney, I don't know if you want to make some comments about that. About I wanted to, I was going to hop in, but I didn't want to cut you off. Please, we, we have a, a team, um, so kudos to the Far Edge team and some of the work they've been doing. Uh, a lot of our testing stuff for scale is K3s um, just for the footprint because um, they came up to my door and said, yes, I'd like to provision a thousand OpenShift clusters. Um, so we found another solution. We have about one or 2000 scale tests that we've run on K3s with a standard OpenShift hub. 
So we've had, we have developers that use Kind for their PR builds, especially in the open source, because so, a lot of the single components in the open source want to work with Kubernetes, but the supported offerings only on OpenShift. So there's a lot of ways to get started. Okay. Um, a related question from Luke. Could a company leverage this capability along with in-home single node clusters with things like nukes to provide local managed OCP to their associates? So certainly, I think that a lot of the community interest, a lot of the Red Hat customer interest are teams that have been deploying and managing clusters either by hand or through Ansible or some other automation terraforms really popular there too. And they want to offer a more self-service approach to getting access to clusters, driving configuration of clusters. So certainly it is providing sort of a local managed version of a fleet controller is exactly what the supported offering is attempting to deliver. Okay. Another question from Gareth. Do the cloud provider-based managed clusters require IPI, or can it be any OCP on the cloud provider? I saw Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, but Alibaba was missing from the list, even though Alibaba supports OCP. Just curious if it was left off due to incompatibility or some other reason. No, and if you want to pull up slide five, Mike, uh, just for reference with the team. Uh, we can provision through Hive IPI clusters, what you're going to see on that left-hand uh, arc on this uh, diagram. We can import what you see on the right-hand arc. We are working on supporting provisioning managed OpenShift. Hopefully that'll come uh, before the end of this year, hand-waving roadmaps aside, but that's something that we're working on. Alibaba is not listed because we don't do explicit quality engineering validation of it. But certainly there is no reason that OpenShift on any cloud provider, on any architecture, shouldn't be able to be imported and managed by the product. Um, we've had some interaction, some desire support to run, uh, to import, manage Alibaba run OpenShift. So an OpenShift put on an Alibaba cloud, AliCloud. Um, I will highlight that one of our earliest active uh, collaborators, adopters, contributors in the community is Ant Financial Group obviously related to Alibaba, and they actually have used open cluster management for their internal version, which they run in their data centers, not necessarily cloud, but that, that becomes something that's, it's a good validation point for us to, to recognize the general impact that it can have. Excellent, okay. Another question from Mark who asks, do you see a product and project enhancements aligned with the explosion of standalone 5G? Very much so. So single node OpenShift, in fact, Gurney's already highlighted internal team name, we call it Far Edge. But this is a team that is specifically focused on making single node OpenShift very consumable, very easy to integrate. So um, within the supported offering, while Hive is the primary way that we provision uh, clusters, there's new capability around assisted installer, which taps into Hive, but brings support to provision bare metal single node OpenShift. That's something that is in the supported offering as, you know, you can file a support case against Red Hat and we will resolve your issue with the product. But certainly um, using a hub cluster to manage a fleet of edge devices running OpenShift clusters is well within the bounds of both the community desire and the supported offering desire. Where we have really kind of looked to enable scalability, we, we expect that at that scale, a hub cluster, we validate, test, and support up to 1,000 managed clusters. And we expect that at a telecom 5G scale, where you're dealing with order of hundreds of thousands of clusters, you're going to have multiple hubs that are each dealing with a, a shard, a subset, and each of those hubs can be backed by the same configuration in GitHub or Object Store. So I don't have to go touch each of the, you know, X number of hubs. I can still deliver configuration consistently across them. Okay. We are coming up on time. So we're going to get one last question is in that is related to uh, the previous one from Pierre. 
how will this be deployed for edge sites that do not have permanent TCP IP connections? Perhaps Scupper could be of assistance here. A great question. So we have focused our energy on the integration of submarines. There's different reasons behind it, but you could, in the community, deploy Scupper across a fleet. You could leverage these primitives to make the configuration of Scupper across multiple clusters easier. It just hasn't been a core focus for what we've done in the community today. The communication between the clusterlet and the hub can tolerate some um, can tolerate the fact that there is uh, maybe intermittent latency. The clusterlet we use a Kubernetes lease in order to understand whether it's ready. So there is a window of time that you can configure if you want to. You know, if it's only checking in once a minute, once an hour, like that's something that you can you can manage that. And it will still consider the cluster available within whatever that range of time is. And if the cluster becomes completely detached from the hub, if it has policy configuration on it, it will continue to reconcile and enforce that locally, even if it can't reach the hub, but it won't receive any new configuration during that window where connectivity to the hub is lost. Good to know. So for those of you who still have questions, we will submit them to our guests um, and hopefully get the answers out on the YouTube and source pages where this recording will be. We will also post a link to the slides, which a lot of you have asked about um, because they were so informative. So with that, I'd like to thank our guests, Gurney, Michael, and Mike um, from the um, Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management team. Thank you all so much for coming in and explaining all these various projects and how they interconnect. Absolutely, thank you so much, Brian, for having us. We enjoyed it. Excellent. Thank you. So with that, oh, with that, we will wrap up this edition of Community Central. We will officially be going on our hiatus. This is the end of season seven. Thank you all so much for being a part of Community Central today and in previous sessions. We certainly do appreciate all the uh, participation. Uh, we will see you later this summer. Uh, until then, be safe and be well.